Good afternoon. My name is Frazier O'Leary. I'm the um, chair of the Teacher Retention Committee on the DC State Board of Education. I'm the Ward 4 representative. Along with me today are Darren Fleischer, who is a policy analyst, Alexander Ju, who is the policy analyst and the person who's responsible for our teacher retention committee, and Simone Wright, who's running the whole show today. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you. I am a retired teacher from DCPS. I retired in September in um, 2017, after 47 years of teaching English. And I also teach at the University of the District of Columbia. Having teachers stay in our wonderful profession has always been of extreme importance to me. And our report has highlighted several of the major reasons why teachers leave. We welcome your input today. Thank you all for coming and I hope that you will be um, educated by us. So the goals are for to interpret and analyze the DC State Board's uh, teacher attrition survey data and its findings, and to develop a narrative about why teachers are leaving classroom schools and or sectors in the District of Columbia, both in the public and the public charter schools, and for us to brainstorm and discuss next steps and solutions to address teacher attrition in the district. Now we're going to have a wonderful video that was put together by uh, the staff of the State Board of Education. And I hope that you'll sit back, relax, and enjoy listening to teachers and students and other members who are concerned with teachers leaving our profession. When a teacher leaves, it's suddenly like a student has to regain that relationship they had with the previous teacher. And midway through the year when they're in the middle of learning and they're in the middle of their course, they now have to establish this relationship again. My teacher left in the beginning of the year and for the first month or so, we didn't really have anybody in the class and it was more like just other staff members watching over the class. When we went to our next grade, we was a little stuck. The gaps in their knowledge would widen. I've seen this specifically at my school um, since I teach 11th and 12th grade students. Sometimes losing that resource is a little bit more difficult than just now somebody's not teaching third or fourth grade. Now it's like, all right, I lost one of my go-to people when it comes to using technology. We go home at night thinking of our students and, and how we can help them. And it, it takes a toll. I don't really need much. Um, from my administrators or from my coaches or from my colleagues. But what I do want or what I would like consistently is touch and check-ins. We know that teachers who are underprepared or do not get substantial support in clinical practice in their preparation are two to three times as likely to leave the profession. What teachers need is um, that kind of intensive coaching or uh, mentoring. Principals are really a key factor in supporting teachers and in helping uh, retain them. Schools with the greatest needs, the most disadvantaged populations, tend to have more turnover and not just higher rates of turnover of teachers, but also of principals. A lot of the students from those low-income risk neighborhoods, they don't understand what real stability is. When teacher attrition happens, they feel like someone's abandoned them again. It feels just like their grandmother or their mother or their father or their uncle or, you know, somebody that they looked up to in the community. When teachers keep turning over, it just perpetuates the cycle of students feeling like, oh, well, we can't trust them. Oh, they're just going to leave. Why, why bother? My daughter used to go to my charter school. And when I was thinking about where she would go for kindergarten, I was realizing that I wasn't sure who was going to be her kindergarten teacher at my charter school. It kind of feels like someone left your team. So then also the morale of the staff, teachers and admin, kind of goes down because, well, now there's no other adult that wanted to stay here for the rest of the year. We can't create impactful solutions unless we fully understand the problem. We have one of the highest rates of teacher attrition in the United States in both the public and the public charter schools. 
we don't make the space for them to um, have opportunities um, beyond just being in a classroom. This idea of what can teachers do for our school, I think it should be what schools can do to better a relationship with our teachers. So it's important that teacher preparation and early career mentoring and supports are things that states, and in particular the District of Columbia, invests in long term. Almost 90% of the teachers said they were passionate about teaching and that they wanted to stay. And if teachers could plan on their future at these schools more than a year at a time, that would help make a stable environment and a trusting environment. In order for me to continue the rest of the school year, I need to make sure that I'm in a good place in order to be in a good place for the kids. I miss them every single day and I and I feel guilty that I left, but I, I hope they know that I didn't leave them. I just left school. Great. Um, thank you so much, Fraser, for um, the introductions and um, to everyone who's able to join us for this session. Um, as Fraser noted, my name is Alex Jew, and I am a policy analyst at the DC State Board of Education. Um, and we are all really excited here today to talk to you about um, our teacher attrition survey that was administered um, earlier this year with results that came out in early March. Um, and just share with you some of the data that we uh, learned and found based on our survey. Um, the format of today's session will be, we're gonna go over um, some of the data using um, some visualizations and kind of um, talking through the narrative. Um, we'll have a short question and answer period after that data um, review to answer any clarifying, session, clarifying questions and then we'll be breaking out into um, small breakout groups to kind of dig a little bit deeper into teacher attrition and the data and uh, potential solutions when we think about it from both the data side as well as a um, policy side. Um, but before we get to all of that, I did want to um, kind of share with everyone kind of the purpose that the state board um, identified for, for why we decided to do this survey on teacher attrition. Um, the state board for some time had been hearing concerns from constituents um, at its public meetings. Um, we had released um, some previous reports on teacher attrition. And for individuals who are not familiar with the DC State Board of Education, uh, the state board is the only elected body in the District of Columbia um, that's responsible for um, public education issues when it comes to um, our, our public educated, uh, publicly educated students in the district. Um, there is one member from each ward, and as Fraser noted, um, he is the ward representative for Ward 4. Um, so members had been hearing a lot about teacher attrition being an issue. Um, we had also recognized that the existing res research on um, teacher attrition in the District of Columbia was really just focused on um, why effective teachers were leaving um, and really seemed to prioritize only effective teachers. And so we wanted to dig a little bit deeper to get a better understanding about why all teachers were leaving um, and what some of the key drivers were. Um, and so as I noted, um, the survey, we'll get into some of the methodology in a little bit, um, but we did survey teachers who departed classrooms um, over both school year 2017-18 and after school year um, 18, 19. Um, and as we said, we probed them for, for why they had left their classroom or their school or their LEA or their sector. Um, so a little bit about the methodology before getting into the data. Um, the survey was open for roughly three weeks. Um, it was administered from December 30th, 2019 through January 17th, 2020. Um, right after um, kind of the holidays and just over the new year. Um, the survey was administered electronically via email um, and it was distributed to just over 2,000 public school teachers in the District of Columbia. Um, the survey was a little bit on the longer side. It was 72 questions um, and it took about nine minutes for um, each individual to complete. Um, and as far as incentivizing um, participants, there, the survey was completely voluntary and the state board did not provide incentives to participate. Um, after the survey, 
Um, there were a series of follow-up um, discussions in both focus groups as well as interviews that allowed the state board to have quantitative data but also qualitative data related to um, teacher attrition in the district. And then lastly, um, as far as those 2,000 teachers that the survey was sent to, um, the information was procured through um, data sharing agreements with the Washington Teachers Union and seven charter LEAs that represent about 29 individual charter schools in the District of Columbia. Um, all the contact information that was received um, and the data itself was only transmitted between the research vendor that um, the State Board had partnered with and the sharing entity. So the State Board actually never received any of the contact information for, for the teachers. Um, this is really important to note um, for a variety of reasons, um, because in the District of Columbia, there is no single publicly accessible list of teacher names or contact information. And so the process by which we actually procure this information was um, a little bit difficult, um, but we did um, successfully procure a list of over 2,000 recently departed teachers for our survey. Um, the actual sample size of the survey, so we, as I noted, sent the survey electronically to over 2,000 teachers. Um, we had a completion rate of about 12%, so about 12% of the folks who received the survey responded. Um, and our research vendor had indicated that the response rate was in line um, with the, the appropriate kind of methodology and making sure the, that the survey was valid, if you will. Um, some demographic notes. Um, I'm not going to go through everything here. We will provide this information um, with everybody else later. Um, but the breakdown, you know, about three quarters of the folks were identified as female, another quarter as male, um, over 50% identified as black, um, about 7% identified as Hispanic. Um, some other interesting things, um, there is a pretty even distribution across all of the kind of K through 12 grade bands. Um, and then we did have a slightly larger percentage of traditional public school teachers responding to our survey at about 60%. Um, and that was largely, I think, due to the fact that one of the partners that we had worked with on procuring um, data was the Washington Teachers Union, who does uh, have the collective bargaining agreement with DC public schools. And so now um, what I'm gonna do as well as my colleague, Darren, um, we are going to go through about seven or eight kind of key takeaways from the data. Um, as I noted, we're going to go through this relatively quickly, but we will leave some time at the end of this section of the presentation for folks to ask clarifying questions about any of the information that's been shared um, on the data or the process or the methodology. Um, and uh, before we, as I said, before we go into our breakout sessions. And so the first thing that I'd like to share with everybody is, you know, I think what everybody is probably thinking about from the survey, um, you know, our, our big goal was trying to identify what were the primary drivers that teachers were leaving the classroom in the District of Columbia. And so there really were two big drivers on the quantitative side uh, based on the survey information that we received. Um, so DCPS teachers cited impact or the teacher evaluation system as really the primary reason for them leaving the classroom. And so about a quarter of teachers actually cited a teacher evaluation as that, that primary driver. Um, on the public charter school side of things, teachers cited work culture and workload as the primary reasons um, at, a, at about 20% each. Um, and so, you know, what we learned from this is that you know, teacher evaluation was a, was a huge thing and is kind of a, a thing that um, one of the teachers noted as, um, you know, creating frustration um, and creating a polarizing environment. Um, and then on the work culture and workload side, you know, there were a lot of participants who described um, general culture and environment of schools. And this is across both sectors, not just um, in the public charter school sector but as being in the trenches, surviving, and being at war. And so really the key takeaways from this um, visualization and this, this data point are um, teacher evaluation, workload, and work culture as being, as being primary drivers. 
Um, some other key drivers, and this is more on the qualitative side of the data, as I mentioned at the beginning, there was a survey um, done, but after that we did follow up, up with qualitative focus groups as well as um, structured interviews. There were three focus groups, each included about six to nine participants, and then we had 13 individual structured interviews um, following that. And so that was an opportunity for the research vendor to kind of dig deeper and probe on some of the quantitative um, aspects of the survey results. And so through that, we also found that there was a lack of support for teacher safety and mental health, and that was also on the student front too. Um, and then also um, participants cited that there was tension um, and really strained relationships between teachers and their school leaders. And so a lack of um, support was felt um, by teachers from their administration. And then lastly, some teachers also cited issues with implementation of discipline um, in their schools. And I will actually pause right here because uh, there is a really great question um, in the chat from Ashok Ali um, at Ed Intelligence. Um, and this is a great clarifying question that I think um, does deserve some time to be answered right now. So thank you for asking it. Um, and the question is, does your study differentiate between teachers quitting teaching job entirely and teachers moving to another school in the same state or the different state or other private schools? And so the answer to that question is yes. Um, so there was differentiation that was done and my colleague Darren will actually share with you all of the data points that were collected with respect to how our teachers were leaving. Um, and so we did ask at the front end if teachers you know, quit voluntarily, um, and so that would have been through resignation, um, or if they um, were forced to leave, whether it was through an early retirement package or they were fired. And so there was some differentiation on the front end as to actual departure region. Um, and then on the, on the end of the survey, we actually asked questions about, you know, are you going to be moving to another school um, in the District of Columbia? Are you going to be moving to a school out of state? Um, and so we are able to really kind of paint a picture and kind of create a narrative around, you know, oh, maybe we want to find a better idea of teachers that were leaving their public, their um, traditional public schools to go teach in um, a neighboring, you know, jurisdiction, maybe Maryland or Virginia, um, in DC's case. Um, what did it look like and were there primary drivers that people were moving to those jurisdictions. And so our data does allow us to do that. Um, we're not gonna get to all of kind of the granular pieces of our information and data today, but that is something that um, it does allow us to do. And so we'll also, um, Ashok, be happy to share with you kind of the, the final report where you can kind of look at all of the different questions, all 72 questions um, and the different data tables and things like that. And so if you wanted to explore it and kind of explore different narratives, you'd be welcome to. Um, Simone, actually, I think we're going to, I'm going to skip this slide. Actually, no, I'm not going to skip this slide. There's one thing I want to highlight on this slide um, is the, the last bullet, actually. And so issues related to facilities, compensation or benefits, um, curriculum, or parents or students were cited significantly less for why teachers departed um, the classroom in, in the District of Columbia. And the table above just really notes some of the uh, very specific factors that folks um, selected as to their departure reason. I think this is the top six. Um, one thing to note is that individuals were able to pick two to three um, kind of major factors for why they departed. So they could have chosen a lack of professional support um, from administration, as well as not liking their teacher evaluation system, as well as um, not enough resources for discipline or behavior or they could have just chosen one. But there was a list of quite a few, I would say probably almost, um, I don't have the exact numbers and so I don't, I don't wanna misquote myself, but anywhere from maybe 60 to possibly 75 um, different choices that they could have chosen um, broken down. So now we can go to the next slide. Thank you, Simone. Um, and this is another one, and I know Frazier likes to, to pop in on this and so if he's, still around, um, we'll have him pop in. But, you know, 
as Frazier noted, he was a lifelong teacher in the District of Columbia um, and really had, and I can speak to this, real passion for teaching. Um, and so what this chart shows is that of the teachers surveyed, over 86% were passionate about teaching, but the majority did not feel they received the adequate support from their school or LEA to stay. Um, there was this one teacher noted this constant anxiety, judgment, insecurity, and fear that kind of came with being observed in the classroom um, and that, you know, they thought, them, thought of themselves as a bad teacher their whole life, but they had this immense passion from a young age. And so this chart, you'll see that um, there was a question that we asked respondents to respond to um, and say, you know, do you agree or not agree with the statement, I am passionate about teaching. And you'll see that the majority, as we said, 86%, um, strongly agreed or agreed with the statement, regardless of how long they had been in the classroom. And even some teachers in their early years too, um, where we often see departure happening sooner, um, all saying, you know, I'm passionate about teaching, but I wasn't supported. Um, and then Fraser, I don't know if you have any anecdote or anything you might want to provide um, to, to add to that. Uh, I, we don't have the time for me to share those anecdotes. Uh, but uh, the thing about it is, is that we, what we hope that this survey will help with is to uh, allow systems to provide mechanisms so the teachers don't even think about wanting to leave. When Alex was talking about the fact that compensation and or building uh, structures were, if they taught in buildings that weren't brand new or whatever, it had nothing to do with their leaving. And what we want people to understand is that almost everyone starts teaching because they're, they want to be teachers. And hopefully, now I didn't, I didn't ever think when I was a beginning teacher that I was gonna wind up teaching for, and I'm still teaching, so it's now it's over 50 years. But, but I gained a love of it quickly. And I had a lot of support from everyone in the building. And the problem, what we found with these teachers is that the support from the system and also from the local level buildings sometimes was lacking. Thanks, Frazier. <clears throat> um, another really good clarifying question in the chat that I, I do wanna address now, um, Ramona Edlin asked, did effective and less effective teachers have the same reasons for leaving? Um, and um, we do have information on that. And so one of the things with um, the effectiveness piece is that we, due to the nature that there is not a publicly single source accessible database of all teacher contact information and um, teacher information, the effective rates actually had to be self-reported. Um, and so there was not necessarily a kind of significant trend between why effective and less effective teachers were leaving. Um, we did see that some who were less effective um, suggested not having enough support in the classroom um, or feeling burdened, um, but um, that would be um, my quick answer to that. And I would have to dig back into the report to, to come up with a, um, a more nuanced answer to your question, Ramona. Um, but that is my on the spot answer. Um, the next thing still on the passion piece and kind of support piece, um, there really was not any encouragement or support for teachers to stay. And this was across the board. Um, and so this chart really notes that about a third of teachers indicated that their school leadership did not encourage them to stay after they had indicated that they were gonna be leaving their school. Um, and that over 50%, almost 60% of teachers actually sought out help prior to them leaving for their uh, primary departure reason. Um, and so what this is showing is that, you know, to the passion piece, teachers wanna be in the classroom. They're trying to stay in the classroom. They're trying to get the support that they need, um, but that, are not able to get that from whether it's their school, their LEA, um, or another source. Uh, 
Um, this next chart um, just shows again, kind of some other data points that were collected. We did ask folks to report whether or not they were a DC native, um, you know, to see that, to kind of think about, you know, folks who grew up in the District of Columbia might be more likely to stay. Um, and one thing that we saw was that growing up in the district does not appear to have a significant effect on the number of years a teacher remains at their school. Um, and also DC natives don't necessarily appear to choose to teach in a school that is more or less di diverse, whether it's around race, ethnicity, a cultural background or socioeconomic background. Um, and I know Frazier notes this, but this is, you know, it's also attributed to the fact that the district is um, rapidly gentrifying um, and the, the people who are teaching in the district um, are coming from a variety of backgrounds and places and expertise now too. One other thing too, Alex, is that when I first started teaching, uh, there were, the majority of the teachers were graduates of DC Teachers College, uh, or a lot of them were. And for uh, maybe the last 25 years, um, uh, UDC's education department has undergone a lot of changes. UDC's education department now has a teacher component again, so hopefully that will help uh, local teachers to stay in the in the district. But uh, there's been a big change in the ages of teachers, and obviously people my age have have retired by now. One would think, and uh, but the uh, that was a that was a big change in the makeup of the of the teachers in DC when we're talking about natives in the classroom, uh, and it was always it was always very helpful to be someone living in DC to teaching in DC. Thank you, Fraser. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, um, Darren Fleischer, to talk through some other um, components of the survey and um, the different data points that were actually collected. Thank you, Alex. So in this survey, or survey, in this graph, you can see four groups of teachers broken out by the level of students participants felt were at risk or from low income households. This is one of those variables that were self reported. Uh, for example, the all group means the teachers felt all the students they taught at, at their school were either at risk or from low income households. Uh, for reasons why teachers left their school, and Alex alluded to this earlier, survey participants could select multiple reasons for the survey questions. For example, a single survey participant could have listed both curriculum and roles and responsibilities, or they could have chosen all eight of those choices. Uh, when, it, when asking whether there was a difference between these four groups, all, most, about half, or a few, uh, we found several different reasons why when comparing across these different groups. So looking at the first two groups, all or most, of their students were at risk or low income, we found that they left for a variety of reasons, none standing out more than the rest. This might be interpreted signaling that their school experienced a variety of issues that pushed them out. For the groups of teachers that said that about half of their students were at risk or low income, some of the reasons for leaving became more apparent. Nearly half felt that climate, culture, or compensation were reasons they left their school. Unlike the other um, all or most groups above, uh, facilities, school environment did not play a role in their decision to leave. And then lastly, looking at um, the, the last group of teachers claiming that they only had a few students who are at risk for low income showed a stark difference in the reason for leaving. A little over a third indicated that they left among other reasons because of issues around roles, responsibilities. Unlike the other groups, this last group also did not indicate leaving because of issues with students or parents or because of issues with facilities or the school environment. Thank you. And I think we could move on to the next slide.
in this next slide, uh, we organized the different variables collected from the teacher retention survey into four categories. Some of the, these variables were used to create the graphs displayed earlier, uh, while other variables were used to answer questions in the full report. They're broken out by teacher attribution, for example, birth year, race, ethnicity, by teacher experiences. So these are years teaching at school before departure, total years in teacher profession. The next category, departed school attributes. So this is the school they left. So for example, type of school, was it a traditional, public, charter? Um, what ward was the school in? And then the last category, current school environment attributes. And this speaks to Ashok's question from earlier, uh, discussion of current job status or future plans. So what type of school are they teaching in now? And if not, what are they doing now? Good afternoon. So, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, as Fraser shared, my name is Simone Wright, and I am a summer policy fellow with the State Board. Thank you, Fraser, Darren, and Alex, for sharing such insightful information from the 2020 DC Teacher Attrition Survey. Before moving into our small group discussions, we want to provide about five to six minutes for any clarifying questions that you may have. Um, more so specifically around the information that was just shared. Um, in terms of general questions, we will save those to later. So I'm going to turn it back over to Alex and Darren to address any questions that may be coming up in the chat box or if anyone would like to raise their hand and come off of mute to also ask questions as well. Um, Ashok from Ed Intelligence has a question. Would you like to come off mute and ask that question? Hello, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good afternoon. So, uh, I mean, uh, I worked uh, on PMF and with PCSU from 2010 to 13. And once one thing, I, and this study is pretty good. Uh, and then what I'm trying to understand now is within that roles and responsibilities section, right, where you said that the teachers are leaving because of different roles and responsibilities. And oftentimes, with some of my prior experience working with the schools, I've seen their frustration, especially they are wearing multiple hats, right? There are gonna be different data validation timelines. There are compliance requirements to meet. And within that roles and responsibilities also, we can literally break it down into two, three, four, five subgroups, right? And then I'm just, my question is, have you looked into that details, drilling down further into which particular roles and responsibilities uh, is contributing more towards their frustration and then, and, then, and then prompting them to leave school? Have you looked into the, in, in that detail? Um, Ashok, I'll, I'll attempt to answer that question. And so we have not drilled down too, too much into that detail. I think um, one of the, you know, I think though the survey is, was valid and our um, vendor affirmed its validity, um, we haven't been able to get that granular due to an end size. And so um, these questions about um, current workplace or future workplace were also voluntary. And so um, not everybody was required to answer them. Um, and so we don't have the full, uh, full sample size um, for, for folks who answered those questions. And so to get as granular, we weren't able to. Um, but really largely what we did, and I'm trying to find the exact question right now um, in my notes. And if you bear with me one second, I will, um, share that with you. Um, so yeah, as far as like specificity goes, really the, what we did was when we asked about if they were teaching in a school, it was really just around sector. And so not necessarily around specific role within that sector. And so, you know, is it, are they back in a traditional public school? Are they in a uh, charter school? Are they in an alternative school? Um, are they in a private school or something other? We did also ask, you know, whether or not to your question earlier, Ashok, um, whether they're inside or outside of DC um, or possibly even in the DC metro area. And then we also ask kind of for, for some folks, a lot of people see teaching and early departure of teaching kind of as a springboard into other types of education related roles. And so we wanted to probe that as well too, to see if folks were leaving the teaching profession to 
seek out a different type of role, but in the education space. Um, and those are really kind of the big buckets that we address. We weren't really able to get any more granular than um, specific um, disciplines or specific um, roles mm -hmm. in those um, types of organizations or spaces. Okay. Thank you. I think one cool. thing too, um, when you're talking about the, uh, the impact and uh, the impact that the impact has on the teachers, a lot of teachers when I was teaching uh, were very much involved with the school, with extracurricular activities, coaching, doing tutoring and all these other things, but those things were not appreciated on the impact evaluation. And I think that the, a lot, most teachers leave the system because they don't feel as though they're appreciated. And I, I think that that was one of the reasons uh, why, I meant, why many of them mentioned the evaluation system as not being uh, whole in its evaluation. That it was very data-driven rather than um, soul-driven. Yep, that answered my question. Thank you, that's helpful. And then, um, Anne, I do see your question and just to be cognizant of time, I'm gonna give a quick answer and then we, um, we could address it at another time. Um, the information on school on like issues with discipline was largely observed in the qualitative process of, um, of the survey uh, or the following the survey. So in the focus groups and the interviews and so the report itself actually has not necessarily transcripts, but really great summaries of the three focus groups, as well as the 13 structured interviews with key observations that were um, identified from there. And um, in there, there's some information related to kind of more specific discipline pieces, but I couldn't point to any um, off the top of my head. Um, and then let's see here, Kayla Green, asked in your survey results or focus groups, did you uncover what specific supports teachers felt they needed in order to perform their roles and responsibilities? Um, Kayla, I think that's a, a great question. One might argue that that is, that is also kind of a, a silver, you know, the, the million dollar question, if you will. Um, you know, what are those roles or what are those supports that teachers actually need to be successful? And that I think is something that you know, as we break out into our small groups, we can kind of further probe. Um, but it really did vary across the board um, from professional development things to mentorship, um, to recognition of work-life balance, you know, variety of things across sectors and um, grade bands and spaces. Simone, would you like to transition us? <laughs> sure. Thank you, Alex, for, for being so responsive to our participants. Um, we, as I stated earlier, we are about to transition to small group discussion time, um, where we probably will be in groups of about four to five people. I am gonna give you all about 60 seconds to review the outcomes for this time. maybe not 60 seconds, but 45, you will have 15 to 20 minutes to, to have a discussion around these outcomes shared above on the screen. When we, will return, when we return, you will need a speaker to share out a summary of the discussion that you had in your small groups and some potential next steps, either for the state board or even for your group as leaders in the space. Before we transition into small groups, I wanna take a moment to highlight some norms for our discussion time. And the goal is to use these norms so we can maximize the, the brief 15 or 20 minutes that we have to, to start to dig into some of the, the things that Alex and Darren shared. I believe Darren is about to send you off into small group world um, we will come back together at 2.05. Hi, um, Preeti and Kayla, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Great. Um, um, I'm recording this, so I might participate through the chat. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Preeti. Um, I'm going to share my screen right now, mm -hmm. and um, we're just going to have kind of a, a small group discussion um, 
related to um, my presentation. So if you just give me one second, I'm gonna pull up my stuff. So as Simone mentioned, we're gonna do some small group discussion on the survey. Um, and we have about 15 or 20 minutes to do this. And so um, before we do that, I wanted to just see if any folks in this group had any um, additional questions. I know Kayla, you had asked one in the chat, um, wanted to see if um, anybody else had any specific questions either. All right, I'm just gonna talk, it's just gonna be in the recording. Um, so I was wondering, I saw your stats over like how many individuals that were surveyed were from DC. And I just wanted to know the end size. I didn't see like a total N of the, the number that were from DC. Um, and maybe I just missed it. So everybody who was surveyed was a DC public school teacher. Like homegrown or like a resident. Oh, homegrown. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yes, that was not shared with you and I can find that information for you right now um, as I look at the full thing. So yeah. And I was, I know that this was really focused on like why teachers leave, but like mm -hmm. I'm really focused on like what makes them stay mm -hmm. um, and like how, right, like how can teachers feel supported? And I, I honestly like, so I used to work for a teacher residency program. And so mm -hmm. I feel like in that first three years of being a teacher, like there's a lot of support that's needed that I don't necessarily feel like if you don't have a program to support you that's provided. Um, so, and I just don't think that those supports are available in schools. And so I'm curious about like what that looks like in terms of mentorship and support. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question, uh, Preeti. Yeah, to that point, I think that's kind of where my question was coming from is uh, what systems of support do teachers need? And I think specifically through the lens of professional development, um, because teachers do have that time allocated to them and that is the time they are supposed to be supported. So what's actually supposed to be happening during that time uh, to help create systems or create the space for mentorship? Um, like what is it that they're, they feel like they're missing that would keep them? Yeah, um, and so I think one of the things, and I'll address Kayla's question first, um, was there are some specific things that are listed in the qualitative um, portions of our study with respect to what people explicitly stated. Um, you know, some people more so on the traditional public school side of things recognize that some of the professional developments were not as structured, or not as structured isn't the right word, were not as appropriate um, for, for them and for their particular context and that they felt very general um, and kind of like a top-down kind of this is the PD that you're going to be taking right now um, and whether or not it was actually applicable and address particular sports more kind of like a blanket right. approach to PD. Um, and people and don't so really there get was, choice in the PD that they, that they get, right? Like you can't choose what you want to do. Yeah, and I think some folks stress this idea of like with respect to PD, you know, could could and I think and I'm trying to remember this I don't I don't remember it completely but could someone um, you know decide to shadow in a particular classroom right mm -hmm. um, you know because they know that that teacher is an expert teacher um, in their particular field um, and like could they use to Kayla's question of like yes teachers are allocated you know, professional development time, could they choose to use their 10 hours of PD time for the quarter um, to, to do that? Could they kind of self-direct their PD? Um, and again, it, it, it totally varies. Um, but as we, let me go to the next slide because I think we're already going to be behind. Um, and Preeti, I did not forget about your DC question. I will get it to you. It, it's um, fine. I can wait. I feel like if other people have things they want to share. Um, but yeah, so the first part we're doing right now is kind of sharing the initial reactions to the tr teacher attrition survey data, asking kind of clarifying questions. Um, the next question really is, wanted to get folks thought, and I think there has been some of this already, around sharing anything that you might feel is missing from the data, um, or kind of gaps, if you will, um, and what people's thoughts are maybe on that front. 
I know you said something about um, in the past, you mostly surveyed or the focus was on teachers who were highly effective or effective leaving the district. And that recently you shifted focus to also include like all teachers who were leaving um, the, the profession. Um, so I'm curious to know, like to see how that relates to the, the, the systems of support that they said they needed or or why they said they were leaving, um, like how that correlates perhaps with their um, their rating. Yeah, and so just one clarity, clarifying question. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as the existing research on effective teachers leaving the classroom, that is something that was always done by DC public schools. Um, mm -hmm. And so that is actually information that the state board did not do. Um, but it's kind of like the direction that most kind of LEAs are thinking about teacher attrition is like, we really just want to make sure our effective teachers are staying. Um, we need to probe why have they left? What can we do to make sure effective teachers are leaving? Where I think Frazier, Dr. O'Leary has said this before that, um, you know, one of the important things is, yes, ensuring our effective teachers are staying but also ensuring that teachers who want to be teachers and who are passionate about the profession but might need additional supports, you know, what can be done to, to help them grow and learn? And they may not be rated as effective or highly effective at the beginning. And so also probing, you know, why um, and what can be done there. Anything else? I know, Kayla, that wasn't really a good answer for your question. I think we have 10 minutes left in our small groups, that's why. Um, and so just thinking about the next 10 minutes, I think we can kind of navigate this. We don't have to do everything um, in this discussion. Um, but one is we can review some best practices for addressing teacher attrition. And we have a slide that just has some that were, um, that's in the research based on things from like places like the Learning Policy Institute. So we could go to that slide and review that. Um, we could reflect on this, follow, this prompt question, thinking about, you know, hey, Lisa, pretty, you know, the roles that you are in and your realm of influence, what could you do um, to kind of shift the narrative or shift what you heard about the state board and teacher attrition in the district? What could you do to kind of influence or change things? Um, and then, or we could try to do both. Um, <laughs> So I don't know if, you know, three or four, if we want to try to prioritize one of those first, and then if we have time, we can go to the other, um, or what folks might, might think would be best. I'm open to either. I just wasn't sure if Joanna or Lisa have any thoughts or they want to, they have any preference about what we talk about. Okay. Um, so I'm going to suggest that we do number four, just because I think it's a more interesting question. Um, and so the question is, and we can do a round robin, so like a minute for, per person, um, what is something within your realm of influence that could shift what you just heard from the state board around teacher attrition in the district? I can start. Um, so my current role is as an instructional coach um, in DC at a DC public school. And so um i within that realm of influence that's why i'm so intrigued by like what happens during that professional development time uh because i often feel like there's this uh like admin are pitted against teachers and vice versa uh where as like i navigate a space between those two and oftentimes i i wonder how um how teachers can form their own PLCs to help drive their own professional development um, that is just like overseen by admin or like okayed by admin, you know, mm -hmm. instead of relying like so heavily on the administration for that professional development, um, actually being leaders of their professional development. Um, so that's I think creating that PLC space, but that also requires like systems and structures, which I think admin can help to create and coaches can help to create. So that teachers roles and responsibilities are not about creating those system trackers, not about collecting, they just have to like worry about 
their role as teachers and collecting data that influences their classroom and that that data can speak to the professional development that they need to that point about differentiation. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, do you feel like in your role as an instructional coach that you have the ability and authority to actually allow for that differentiation or is that something that you still would need from um, your superiors? I do have the ability to create coaching plans for each person. Um, I think where it gets interesting is how every school has their comprehensive school plan. And so um, the coaching plans have to be aligned to this comprehensive school plan. Um, also where it gets interesting is that the amount of training that coaches go through or don't. Uh, because attrition is so high, oftentimes I feel like those positions are being filled and they never get the day one training. They just jump in where, um, so like to, speaking to my own experience, like I was thrust into this position and um, I didn't get the day one training, how to do this protocol. It was mostly up to me to kind of figure that out and navigate that. Um, so yes, there is the freedom for that. However, I'm not sure that the expertise is always present. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Others, Preeti, Lisa. So Alex, I think Joanna is having some trouble with sound. Okay. So um, she's been sending some questions and comments through the chat box to me. So I think her, this might be going back a little bit, so I don't want to take us too off track, but she did have a question about like the study including administrator performance supervision and feedback, if that was something you looked into. Okay. Um, and then I think that, um, I think I'm just gonna have her kind of message either me or you. Um, if you can see them in the chat, you might, she might have sent them directly to you. So unfortunately, because I'm screen sharing, I don't have the chat window open right I can now. read them out if you. Um, so that would be great, but I will answer the first question that Joanna asked. Um, so related to kind of the administrative evaluation piece, um, really the only evaluate, evaluative criteria that was, um, looked at in our survey was impact scores, so or teacher evaluation scores, um, and that largely is across our DC public schools. Um, and so we asked folks just to self-report whether they were most recently rated as, you know, ineffective or highly effective or any of the three in between. Um, but that was pretty much the extent um, to the evaluative, evaluative criteria that we asked for. Also, Alex, just so you know, 30 minute um, warning. 30 second warning? 30 minute warning for the session. <laughs> oh yes, I did know that. I okay, have my great. timer here. Yeah, <laughs> we're good. We're actually surprisingly um, right on time, which is great. Um, so any other questions that Joanna had in the chat um, or do you wanna read off? Yeah. Um, I think she, her comment was like, she has good experience at retaining teachers when administrators are more involved and provide feedback. I'm gonna agree with that. I think having that feedback, and also I think for my experience working with teachers, like if, if teachers have an idea or they wanna try something new, getting that support that, that'll help those students, like getting that support to do it, um, really helps you feel like you have, you know, some growth and can try new things, um, I think. I think that's why she was asking more about administrators um, as leaders than managers to kind of think about that feedback um, kind of experience. Yeah, and I guess, you know, question that I have, um, you know, the folks that we surveyed were pretty much just like teachers and, and folks in the classroom. Um, and so not necessarily the folks that were um, and if that's getting at Joanna's question, maybe not necessarily the folks that are the leaders of schools, mm -hmm. um, but really, you know, the workhorses, the people who are doing the jobs of making sure that um, everyone in the District of Columbia is getting the best education that they can. Um, um, I think I like maybe that's a good next step, like getting a sense of, you know, supervisors and administrators, like what are you doing? to keep your teachers, how are you, you know, like, and seeing who's retaining more based on data and comparing that, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's super helpful. Thank you so much. Um, 
And so I know we are getting ready to close. And um, Joanna, since she's having audio issues and Kayla had to jump early, yeah. um, we do need someone to report out. <laughs> and so I'm looking to you, Preeti, um, <laughs> unless Lisa would, but I, I haven't heard from Lisa yet. And so she might um, be having audio issues. I don't know. She could be having audio issues as well. Um, um, Okay, let me read one more comment from Joanna. So she sure. also mentioned that um, administrators sometimes do not have like a real understanding of what's going on in the classroom. And so they don't always support teachers in the way that they need. Mm -hmm. I would kind of agree with that too. Um, I, I'm happy to report out. I'm gonna, maybe we can summarize what I should say. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That would be great. And so I think the big things would just be, you know, kind of some of the observations that you all made about the data um, and what some of these gaps were. So the administrator piece that was just discussed, um, Kayla's um, information around, um, you know, roles and responsibilities and what, what actually are those supports that teachers are looking for, the, the tan not necessarily tangible, but the actual you know, list of supports that they need to be able to do their roles and responsibilities. Um, and I really liked Kayla's anecdote about her being this instructional coach and she kind of sits in this, you know, medium between not, not being a teacher but having influence over teachers but not actually being an administrator. Um, and I really appreciated her response to like thinking about her realm of influence. And so um, how can we leverage more experiences like that um, yeah, things like that. I don't think it needs to be a, a terribly lengthy uh, report out by any means. And I appreciate your engagement. No problem. Um, I just need to write it down because right now my brain is all over the place. I can only imagine, Preeti. <laughs> Great. Okay. I can do that. Um, um, Joanna or Lisa, is there anything else that you would like me to share? Feel free to use the chat. All right, well, I will plan to share that. So at the beginning of the session, we shared three major goals for this, for, for this presentation. Interpret and analyze the DC State Board's teacher attrition survey data and its findings. Develop a narrative about why teachers are leaving their classrooms, schools, and or sector in the district. Brainstorm and discuss next steps and solutions to address each attrition. E um, address teacher attrition in the district. This is the part of the session where we will be asking group representatives and individuals to share their thoughts based on the data and narrative presented. Let's start with the group representatives. I will call on each of you to share on your group's reaction to the study, data you felt was missing from the study or should be further explored, and lastly, two or three ways to address teacher attrition in DC. So I'll be calling on group representatives. Um, let's start with group one. Could you raise your hand if you are the group representative for group one? It's me, Darren. <laughs> um, I'm gonna shout for our group. We had some technical issues, so I um, was able to do that. Um, so for our group's reaction to the study, I think um, people were really thinking about that administrator relationship um, and kind of roles and responsibilities, like what supports are teachers getting, um, as well as like in that first few years as a teacher, um, what support and training and PD are they getting to kind of help them in that, you know, next step in their educational career. Um, and I think, I think that Alex put in the question, I was curious about, you know, um, a little bit about like the homegrown student or the teachers and what that data looked like. And I think people were also wondering a little bit about the administrators um, and kind of feedback that they provide and what that looks like in terms of data and support. Um, and then ways to address teacher attrition. Um, we had one individual that was an instructional coach. So she was just talking a little bit about re leveraging roles and experiences um, to kind of support teachers. And then we had another individual that was a principal um, and she mentioned that she does a pretty good job um, of retaining teachers about 80% of her teachers um, she's able to retain 
and she feels that the other 20% leave because of better opportunities. Um, and she feels that people, as they get more comfortable and have a connection between instruction, support, and feedback, they're more likely to stay. Thank you, Pretty. Um, from group two, can you raise your hand? So uh, our, our reaction to this study for our group was that we, we weren't really surprised by the data. We, we kind of agreed with it. Uh, for data that we felt was missing, I think that, of course, there, there were always things that could have been explored a little bit further. We, we all had kind of some additional questions about, well, why could have this been this way? Uh, what could have better supported? Why the numbers were for this way? Um, but then for ways to address teacher attrition, uh, one of the commonalities that we had in discussing was communication, especially communication in terms of expectations very early on seemed to have a, a big effect, uh, especially with teachers incoming to a school for the first time, uh, whether or not they're new teachers or uh, new teachers to a specific location. Their expectations of what things may be like when they start teaching may be completely different from what they actually experience once they're in the classroom, and that can kind of set things off on the wrong foot. Uh, so definitely having different resources to kind of open up the communication for those teachers, especially in the beginning of the year as well as resources for leadership and administration to better facilitate a more positive environment for all staff members and students throughout the year. Uh, those were some of the things that we discussed. Great, thank you. And then the last group, um, the group with Fraser. Uh, could we have a group representative share out maybe about two minutes of what your group shared? All right, so our group started with me talking about my personal observation of the school, a DC public charter school that I worked that changed uh, principal, three principals in less than four years. And uh, so I started to mention that the leadership reshuffle is a big problem that might have contributed to the teacher retention issues. And the Carla jumped in to say, uh, she's very interested in data collection and survey process throughout this uh, uh, activity that DC has its rules on in place that might make it difficult to inform policy and um, so her biggest or primary takeaway is to see the difference between DCPS and DC charter school that uh, some DCPS teachers might find uh, the charter school might uh, teachers might be highly assessed compared to the DCPS teachers and Miranda mentioned her qualitative side uh, saying schools are not encouraging teachers to stay. So I think it's a problem with the school culture. And Fraser mentioned that the current survey is six month old and uh, he's expecting there might be a smaller data in August due to the remote learning and teaching. And, uh, and also we have a fact that with over 2000 requests, we collect less than 15% of the results from teachers, but still it is uh, like a true picture and uh, he look, looks forward to more data coming from teachers. Uh, but the churns of leadership is a bigger issue than teacher retention issues. And Ashok mentioned about the impact score, uh, saying that like, there should be a motivational energy within the system to encourage more teachers to stay. When Fraser mentioned that teacher appreciation week and certain cultural building uh, and um, and apparently this remote teaching for four months uh, is bringing more appreciation to teachers. And he's advocating more appreciation methods for teachers to keep them uh, and the better evaluation to generate better data. And uh, he also observed that uh, there's a lack of mentors for newer and younger teachers to encourage them to stay. And Darren uh, is like, navigating us to put thoughts on the variables missing. And so the data people like Ashok and Carla both mentioned about uh, data access. Uh, the Carla said uh, data literacy gap is a real issue that um, uh, they might have spent amount more more time on compliance. So, so um, really alarming to say, like, how are we gonna weigh student growth in at-risk population? 
when the school administration spends all their focus on compliance. And so Fraser ended the discussion with the impact. Uh, teachers with lower rating were not given a help to improve their performance. It's a real problem when we struggle to make a better teacher in the current system. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we had the right person. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Uh, two other questions that uh, we would have liked to get to is uh, thinking about your role in education. Uh, how will you commit to addressing teacher attrition in the district, your sector, your LEA, or your school? Um, and two, what actions or approaches might the state board take to mitigate future teacher attrition? These are two things that maybe all of you can keep in mind, and maybe we can address it later at the Q&A. Um, but we are going to move on to our next slide. And um, in this next slide, you know, as we're closing out, we just wanted to share um, so after the survey was done and the state board um, produced a report on it and a memo um, that was released in March, um, the state board also issued these five um, kind of recommendations. Um, and so we just wanted to share those with everyone with respect to what the state board's thinking was in early March. Um, to to um, group three's point um, and to Fraser's comment, you know, a lot has changed since March, 2020. Um, and so recommendations and kind of the way we're thinking about school has changed. Um, but really the first one was um, adopting the statewide educational data warehouse amendment act. And so the state board has um, I guess legislation, if you will, before DC council that would create a robust publicly kind of single sourced uh, teacher database. Um, two is on developing mentor programs for teachers at schools you know, that we see that there's immense value in teacher mentorship. Three um, was considering these findings in the DCPS redesign of their teacher evaluation system impact. Um, we do currently know and understand that um, Chancellor Lewis Fairby is working, um, not necessarily working, but um, I think that the American University's School of Education is working to better understand DCPS's um, impact system and what could be done to improve it. Um, and then number four is improving school culture and teacher workload. Again, this is really broad in general, and I think there's a lot that can be unpacked here with what we really need to do to ensure supports are there and um, culture and workload are improved. And then the last thing does get to some of the administrative um, concerns and issues that were raised at today's session around um, school level leadership. And so we have a suggestion um, for the creation of a statewide professional development program for school level leadership when we think about um, what it means to be an effective school leader um, and creating a, uh, a good cohort of um, teachers at your school. Um, these next things, this will be shared in our slide deck that will make sure that um, the summit has available and, and can share out. Um, but these are, are just some resources for everybody. Um, some links, the first is to our full report that folks are welcome to look at. Um, it is also on our state board website, sboe.dc.gov. Um, we do also have a quick um, infographic on the 10 things you should know about teacher attrition, um, a link to our video, which we showed at the beginning of this presentation and then um, the very last link is just the landing page to all things related to teacher attrition and retention um, for, um, for the state board. And now we can use this time. If you have any questions, please raise your hand, uh, place them in the chat. Also, you'll notice um, Fraser and Alex's emails. So if you have any questions afterwards that you think of, just feel free to reach out to them and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Mary, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. And that is that everything we know about teacher attrition and retention in DC right now predates the enormous changes brought about by the pandemic. And um, teachers 
have been hit from every direction um, by both the pandemic and our reaction to it. And I wondered if the board is going to do any follow-up on what, what else we can do uh, to deal with the after effect of all of this. Yeah, thank you for that question, Mary. Um, if Fraser is still here, I might defer to him to answer that question as the um, the representative um, from the state board. I, I know that uh, that I am going to be following it up. I'm just, I'm fascinated with what is going to be the the new reality to um, education because uh, this is. This is all brand new to all of us. And to find out what uh, is going to happen in, in the next couple of months, I'm, I'm fearful that teacher turnover is going to um, really happen before the end of the year. So we'll, we'll, uh, we're definitely going to be on it, though, Mary. Thank you for that. Um, we have just begun our quest to make uh, teacher retention uh, dwarf teacher attrition. Thank you, Mary. Uh, are there any other participants who would like to ask a question? I have, I have a comment or question. Please. Um, so uh, just from the DC public charter school uh, field, that I realized the schools are very sensitive towards their evaluation, like tier one, tier two, and current metrics are focusing more on the like park score, the achievements in math and uh, ELA. And it'd be great if uh, the DC Public Charter School Board can put teacher retention and uh, leadership reshuffle as a factor to indicate the metrics to evaluate schools. If a school has been changing its principal once a year and have more than 25% of the teaching staff like changed, then that should be like put into the evaluation saying this school doesn't have a stable uh, leadership or staff team to maintain a quality, uh, like a quality in education. Um, it'd be great to add that as an aspect for students to shop around when they choose schools from my DC school. Um, apparently, like, I mean, rationally, most parents want their kids to go to a stable school, right? The, their teachers won't leave the class like after a year, just barely knowing students. So personally, it'd be great to add that metrics into the school evaluation for a better shopping around. That's, that's a great idea. Um, unfortunately, it's logical. <laughs> um, but we have to, that's one of the beasts that we have to uh, destroy is the lack of logic in making decisions. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that comment. Uh, does anybody else have any comments, questions? Okay, well, we thank you very much for participating and for taking the time to listen to the, our teacher retention data. As you can see, we have a, a link to the SurveyMonkey Survey Monkey to uh, provide feedback for this session, as well as State Board. Uh, the website is the last link on the bottom, as well as social media websites for the DC State Board of Education. Thank you so much for participating.